Buenas tardes y gracias por estar en este congreso de Comics in Dialogue. My name is Mayra Crow and I will be presenting today Interdisciplinary Collaboration and Public Health Comics, The Gift. Uh, I will proceed to turn off my camera. This presentation examines the capacity for public information comics to transmit complex information in a very clear manner, so it is more accessible for the wider public. The presentation will focus specifically on such comic entitled The Gift, Transforming Lives Through Organization, which forms part of an ongoing series of information comics created by the University of Dundee. The gift was designed to raise awareness about organ donation in an inclusive, open-ended and engaging way. As Sima and Weiner have argued in graphic novels and comics in the classroom, comics are highly valuable in educational settings and as a medium of communication. And it is no longer a question of whether sequential art should be used in educational settings, but rather how to use it and for what purpose. Also, Chris Moore in 2010 said that information comics can be used to meet a specific information need as part of a public information campaign. The Scottish Centre for Comic Studies, based at the University of Dundee here in Scotland, has produced a series of public information comics since 2016. These publications are targeted at the public, health sector, and third sector partners. A multidisciplinary academic team, in conjunction with external partners, collabor collaborate closely on this publications. Why organ donation in Scotland? The creation of the gift transforming lives through organ donation is the result of a need to convey an informed message to the Scottish public. In the first instance, but also the message is about a subject that may be difficult or inconvenient to discuss between families or partners. The project emerged from an honest conversation with my colleague, Dr. Chris Murray, professor in comic studies at the University of Dundee. As part of my role as an ambassador for organ donation in Scotland, I would take part, part in workshops dedicated for secondary education pupils intending to pursue a medical profession. The project was born from that moment. It is an interdisciplinary collaboration of colleagues from the School of Humanities and also the College of Art and Design and other partners. To name Ink Pot Artist, Dundee Comics Creative Space colleagues, the charity Good Life, Good Death, Good Grief, and National Health Service, NHS, Blood and Transplant Nurses in Scotland. Why there's a need to create such a resource? Well, according to the NHS, in 2016, there was a 20% rate of family refusal to organ donation, which means that 343 potential donors were lost, which is unacceptable. Unlike countries at the forefront of donation legislation such as Spain, the UK was falling behind for not having implemented an output system to fill the gap for those individuals who have not expressed their wishes to donate organs or and tissue after their deaths. The comic was created with the objective of informing people of the advantages of organ donation before a legal framework was due to be introduced in Scotland. The Human Tissue Bill was introduced to the Scottish Parliament in June 2018 and passed by Parliament the following year. As part of my volunteer work with organ donation, I was involved in the public consultation process before the submission of the bill 
back in 2016. The last couple of years have been key to get the message across the public and legislators, legislators alike, and the aim was for the gift to be part of that deliverance. It is a matter of not legislating in a bubble. From autumn 2020, the new opt-out legislation will be enforced, and there was a need to raise awareness that people do not need to wait until then to make a decision in whether to opt in or out. They could do it immediately. A team gathered to achieve one aim, to produce a public information comic that encapsulated three main tangible stories, narrating three stages during the organ donation process in Scotland. First, the donation process from the perspective of the donor family. Thereafter, NHS blood and transplant specialist nurses and organ donation, narrating the process and the final story of the organ recipient. The NHS blood and transplant specialist nurses and organ donation were involved at the outset to support the project and provide factual accuracy and insight. Regarding the methodology, the Scottish Centre for Comic Studies based at University of Dundee has implemented what is known as a comics jam process. This process draws aspects from NAPSPRING co-design methodology and it sent at its center is the partnership based co-designing nature of the comics. How does it work and why the name? As you can see in your screen, there's an explanatory step-by-step -step cartoon of the process. It has been called JAM as part of a wordplay in relation with the City of Dundee's association with the three J's of youth, JAM and journalism. Dundee was known for being a youth processor, JAM producer and its journalism. The team started the production of a prototype, discussing what form the output would take i.e. which model was most appropriate for the story being told, the tone, the perspective, the nature of the information, number of pages, if it was going to be digital or printed. The solutions emerged throughout discussions amongst the team. An individual was tasked with the production, which was key to keep everyone in the team updated. That was Dr. Fenley. A different member of the team interviewed each stakeholder with the appropriate consent forms conforming with ethical requirements. There are ethical dimensions surrounding the telling of life stories where this is part of a collaborative and informed exchange, keeping in line with research ethics. It's key. It protects participants and researchers alike and creates a culture of mutual respect and trust between participants and researchers and provides reassurance by maintaining the integrity and reputation of the researchers and host institutions. Interviewees agreed to the following in the consent forms to acknowledge their understanding of the project, their freedom to ask questions regarding the project, to take part in the project, the right to withdraw from the study at any time without specifying the reason of, for their withdrawal. To have their words quoted in publications, reports, web pages, and other research outputs. It was also paramount that interviewees give consent for the data provided to be securely archived on restricted box folders. Also, that other researchers would have access to this data only if agreed to keep the confidentiality. And finally, the acknowledgement that other researchers may use the interviewees' words in publications, reports, web pages, and other research outputs. These interviews were recorded and thereafter transcribed. A jamming session was scheduled in order to create the story script. 
In this jamming sessions, the team had previously read the transcribed interviews in order to provide ideas for the script. It was a collaborative and multidisciplinary effort. Particular attention was paid to the process of organ donation story. A draft was presented to the NHS, the National Health Service, for feedback. As mentioned within the comics jump methodology, is key to work with partners and make them part of the production process. Formal feedback was given to us. The jamming session that was scheduled, in this session, all team members were involved. The team worked with one story at a time, panel by panel, page by page. One team member was the designated scribe, and during the workshop, while the team provide, provided ideas, taking into account the transcripts, of course, um, from those interviews that were conducted for each story, accurately, the, the information was transferred accurately, and also those concepts communicated. Once the script was produced, the next step was to once more present it to the partners for their approval so that work with artists, artists could begin. The Dundee Comic Space also houses Inkpot Studio, where some of the graduates from our master's course in comics and graphic novels work alongside with other artists. Once the script had, had been approved by partners and all involved, the artists began their work. To name some of the artists, Rebecca Horner, Ashling Larkin, Letty Wilson, Helen Robinson, and Katrina Laird. Artists are usually provided with visual aids such as photographs. In this case, you can see in your screen the part of the donor story. Andrew Crow was a peep de depicted here. He, he was the person that donated his organs. And the artist was also given some of his photographs and also um, artwork that he created when he was alive. The script given to the artist also had a detailed description of how the team envisaged the imaginary. During this part of the process, artists were also free to contact interviewees for further clarification of ideas. The artists began by producing thumbnails, a rough version, then an ink version, and finally a color version. During this process, knowledge exchange between partners and artists also took place. The final draft was produced and ready to be signed off by the team. It culminated with the launch of the comic. There was a press release and it received significant media response from newspaper articles, social media, to television interviews and radio. The gift Transforming Lives Through Organ Donation was launched to coincide with the Organ Donation Awareness Week in Scotland in September 2018. The aim to create a resource which, which would enable honest dialogue through comics was accomplished. Legislation in, Scot in Scotland will come into place as an opt-out system this autumn. In words of Leslie Logan, MBE, former Scottish manager for organ donation services, the gift provided Scottish families with a fantastic and valuable resource to demystify both organ and tissue donation and transplantation issues. The gift was supported by and welcomed by the Scottish Organ Donation Service and additionally by healthcare professionals working in this highly specialized area. The gift reflects realistically what actually happens at such 
challenging time and tells the story of courageous people in a modern format. To conclude, the Comics Jam method provides a timely response to a demand of conveying informed messages, be it as an educational tool or to clarify legislation changes as a communication medium. By doing so, ethical issues must be at the forefront when telling life stories. As written in the opening page of the gift, in the following pages, we share heartfelt stories and life experiences related to organ donation. By doing so, we hope to bring awareness to a wider audience and prompt honest conversations about organ donation. Many thanks for your attention, and I invite you to explore our publications. The website, you can see it in your screens. Many, many thanks. Hola a todos, soy Pilar Pomares Puig y pertenezco a la Universidad de Alicante, donde formo parte de la Asociación Unicomic y de la Red de Docencia Universitaria llamada Conocimiento del Canon Artístico entre el Alumnado Universitario, Posibilidades Didácticas. Uno de los objetivos principales de esta red es la promoción de la lectura en la región gráfica de valor artístico en el ámbito universitario y la reflexión de sus posibilidades pedagógicas de, distintas, de distintas perspectivas. En este sentido, hemos desarrollado algunas investigaciones para valorar las posibilidades del cómic eh, con el alumnado con necesidades educativas especiales. En esta ocasión voy a presentar la comunicación titulada Narración gráfica sobre el trastorno del espectro del autismo. El espectro autista constituye una entidad interesante y aún hoy relativamente desconocida. El trastorno del espectro autista, más conocido comúnmente por sus siglas TEA, es un trastorno de origen neurobiológico que afecta a la configuración del sistema nervioso y al funcionamiento cerebral, dando lugar a dificultades en dos áreas principalmente, la comunicación e interacción social y la flexibilidad de pensamiento y la conducta. El presente trabajo tiene un doble objetivo. En primer lugar, observar la presencia que tiene la diversidad funcional de tipo autista en la literatura infantil y juvenil, en concreto en dos formatos basados en la narración gráfica, como cómic y álbum ilustrado. En segundo lugar, nos proponemos apoyar la normalización e inclusión educativa del alumnado con espectro autista de distinto nivel de intensidad. Pasamos ahora a presentar algunas de estas obras. En la primera transparencia pueden ustedes ver el cómic presentado por Rebeca Dávila y Bernardo Fernández, más conocido como B, titulado El autismo no es una enfermedad. Rebeca y Bernardo, los autores de este cómic, son los padres de María, una niña que en el espectro autista. Desde que la niña tuvo tres años decidieron empezar a escribir cómics sobre sus vivencias, donde María es la protagonista, con el objetivo de normalizar su condición ya que, como reclaman afectados profesionales y familias, el TEA no es una enfermedad. Los vecinos pensaban que María era una niña muy rara, por lo que su madre, Rebeca, decidió diseñar un cómic explicando este trastorno y lo pasó por bajo de todas las puertas del vecindario. Con este sencillo TVO, el cambio de actitud que se produjo entre el vecindario, familiares y amistades fue radical. La historieta pasó a la red y se hizo viral. A continuación vamos a ver otro de estos mismos autores. En el año siguiente, 2014, cuando María ya iba a tercero de kinder, lo que es preescolar, de cinco años, y era asistida por una profesora de apoyo en una escuela ordinaria, la escuela le pidió a Rebeca, la mamá de María, que hiciera una nueva historieta, esta vez dirigida a que los niños comprendieran el trastorno. En este segundo cómic, que pueden ustedes ver en la diapositiva número siguiente, se titula Hay niños que tienen autismo y el proyecto ya salió del núcleo familiar para caer en manos de otra ilustradora. En esta ocasión fue Evely y Rebeca siguió haciéndose cargo del guión. Más tarde, Rebeca siguió añadiendo páginas al cómic conforme María fue creciendo, 
según las sugerencias de Beth, el padre, y en colaboración con otros ilustradores, ocupándose ella misma del guión. Por ejemplo, en 2015, Beth contactó con Tania Camacho y ambas colaboraron en el cómic que pueden ustedes ver en esta diapositiva. Autismo manual de usuario, que fue un boom y se fue corriendo por distintas redes sociales como un bombazo. En 2016 colabora con sus amigos Mauro Torres y Conen en el cómic Herramientas Sociales, que pueden ustedes ver a continuación. Y en 2018 con Alejandra Espino crea, crea Autismo de Femenino, un cómic muy interesante para que se viera la perspectiva de las niñas. Lo que Rebeca busca con sus cómics es inclusión, busca que abramos los ojos a la diversidad. A continuación vamos a ver en la siguiente transparencia Habla María, de Bernardo Fernández, el mismo vez que comentábamos eh, anteriormente, Padre de María. En 2018 publicó esta novela gráfica, que constituye un testimonio de la vida del autor desde el momento en que supo que su primera hija nacería, como se enteró de que estaba en el espectro, y nos va contando con dos voces, una la de B, el autor, que narra un camino personal que reconocerán todas las personas cercanas a un niño con diversidad funcional de tipo autista. La otra voz que se puede escuchar y ver en el cómic es la de María, que en ocasiones puede sonar distinta, algo enrevesada, pero a la que solo hay que aprender a escuchar y a observar para poder comprender. Es un cómic que invita a la solidaridad y que pretende concienciar a la sociedad sobre la realidad de este trastorno. A continuación presentamos otra iniciativa muy interesante. La pueden ustedes ver en la siguiente transparencia. Se llama Los Lunes Autismo, promovida por la Fundación Orange. En, fue publicada en 2017, pero dos años antes, todos los lunes autismo, nos invitó a comenzar todas las semanas con una nota de sentido del humor, compartiendo cada lunes viñetas sobre el autismo con todos los amigos inspiradas en anécdotas reales enviadas por familiares y profesionales de personas con, en el espectro autista. Cada lunes, durante dos años, publicaron una historieta para compartir en redes sociales, distintos blogs, Facebook, Twitter, etc., para ayudar a sensibilizar a la sociedad en temas de autismo con un toque de humor. Las viñetas han dado protagonismo a esta peculiar y enriquecedora manera de estar en el mundo y mirar la realidad que tienen las personas con autismo. Este proyecto se ha recogido en un libro ¿sí? y con textos elaborados por un psicólogo especialista en autismo, Juan Martos, y van ejemplificando pues, distintas situaciones de interacción en relaciones sociales, comunicación y lenguaje, sentido común, habilidades especiales, hipersensibilidad, etc. A continuación, en la siguiente transparencia, vamos a presentar El viaje juntos, de Judy and Paul Karasik. Eh, fue publicado en 2009. Estos dos hermanos volcaron 45 años de sus vidas, junto a su hermano autista, David, en un libro que podemos clasificar dentro de un género autobiográfico familiar. Es un libro para adultos. Y va alternando capítulos de texto escrito, novelado y de cómic, además de incluir fotografías familiares. Paul Karasik se dibuja a sí mismo y a los miembros de su familia con un estilo muy realista que hace que todos sean perfectamente identificados identificables, perdón. El mismo realismo se observa en los bocadillos de, y el texto y los dibujos de su hermana que, que firma la parte de él. Veremos ahora otro cómic entre uno de los mis preferidos, Los hermanos extraordinarios, del matrimonio de, formado por Ernesto Larre y su mujer eh, Jennifer Cohen y editado por Autis Forward. Es un cómic muy especial, protagonizado por sus hijos mellizos. El objetivo es mostrar al mundo los superpoderes de, lo, de dos niños con trastorno del espectro autista y también el enfoque. Lo que los padres quieren hacer ver es mostrar al mundo que sus hijos tienen unas capacidades especiales que se pueden considerar superpoderes y que los adultos y los médicos lo llaman trastorno del espectro autista. Los objetivos eran los siguientes. Compartir información confiable sobre el TEA, 
para todas las personas que conozcan o no algún caso, tengan pues, con el afán de crear inclusión y conciencia. Otro objetivo era demostrarle a la gente que en ningún caso el TEA no es el, es el fin del mundo, sino que es el inicio de un mundo maravilloso y lleno de oportunidades. En tercer lugar, quieren ayudar a los padres con información de expertos para un diagnóstico precoz y de atención temprana. Y en último lugar, eh, eh, la organización de eventos y de recaudación de fondos para fomentar la inclusión y el bienestar de las personas con TEA y sus familias. Tienen varios episodios y son descargables en la página de Actins for Good. Bueno, en esta transparencia vamos a presentar otro cómic de Dave y Angela Cobb, lado Steam Punch. Son varios episodios, está el número 1 en 2013, el 2 en 2014 y el 3 en 2015. Dave Cobb, uno de los autores, es una persona que se encuentra en el espectro autista. Fue, fundación de una, fue fundador de una asociación sin ánimos de lucro en Estados Unidos y de una editorial con el mismo nombre, Face Value Comic. Esta editorial lanzó a la venta un cómic que tiene como protagonista a un superhéroe con autismo. Cod, el autor, pretendía apoyar la investigación en la materia y generar vínculos con la comunidad y algunas empresas para difundir información sobre el autismo. El autor estaba convencido de que los cómics ayudan a las personas con autismo a entender su mundo y a interactuar mejor con las personas que le rodean. El cómic tiene como objetivo, además, el aprendizaje social y la lucha contra los prejuicios. A continuación, en la siguiente transparencia, veremos María y yo, quizá el cómic más conocido sobre el autismo, eh, cuyo autor es Miguel Gallardo y fue la edición que tengo yo es de 2007. María y yo es una obra importante, no solo por el tema que trata, el autismo, sino por la mirada delicada y divertida con la que Miguel Gallardo nos muestra su relación con su hija María. Eh, con esta novela gráfica se hizo merecedor del Premio Nacional de Cómic de Cataluña en 2018. Eh, vemos cómo el padre va dibujándole a la niña, cómo le hace listas, que son cosas que hacen feliz a María porque dan sentido al mundo en el que vive. Le ayudan a ordenarlo, le provocan sensación de calma y aclaran sus interacciones con los demás. El cómic narra un viaje de verano del padre y la hija. Este cómic tuvo mucho éxito y siete años después el autor lanzó María cumple 20 años, que podemos ver algunas imágenes en la siguiente transparencia. En María cumple 20 años asistimos a la evolución de la joven, ya una adulta. Al igual que en el cómic anterior, recrea las vacaciones de verano de la muchacha y su padre. Todos estos álbumes y cómics que hemos presentado aparecen eh, niños con, en el espectro autista como protagonistas, ya que niños y jóvenes con necesidades educativas especiales precisan modelos con los que identificarse, así como sentirse representados y valorados. Asimismo, familias y profesorado pueden acudir a este pequeño corpus de obras propuesto para obtener información sobre el espectro autista por medio de la narración gráfica, conocer a otras personas que viven situaciones semejantes, empatizar con los personajes y de alguna manera normalizar este tipo de diversidad funcional, que de ninguna manera puede ser considerado solamente desde un enfoque médico como una enfermera, sino que como reclaman personas en el espectro autista y familiares, es una forma diferente de comprender el mundo. Muchas gracias por su atención y espero que les haya gustado. Hi, my name is Metzli Santa Maria. I am a fourth year PhD student at Universidad Pompeu Fabra. And today I'll be presenting a semiotic analysis of medical content in a collection of graphing pathographies. I will begin by providing background information on the subject and giving the objectives, motivation, methodology, and results for this study. In the last number of years, there's been an increase of graphic medical narratives publications in Western countries, and we have seen that their presence has extended into academic and medical institutions. 
However, in the last couple of months, there has also been an overwhelming number of publications across different social media platforms regarding COVID-19, and these short comics aim to inform society about symptoms and sanitary precautions to be taken um, regarding COVID-19. We can see that medical information is communicated visually in three different types of forms the comic, the graphic novel, and manga. The narratives themselves depict different types of narratives regarding medical staff's daily life, patients' experiences, or they aim to explain the function of certain body parts. In Western society, this type of information is published in comics and graphic novels, while in Asia, they are published in manga format. Specifically, in graphic medicine, we divide the narratives into two types of categories. The first one, the medical visual narratives slash memoirs and graphic orthographies. Under the first category, we can see that they're illustrated from the perspective of the doctor or nurses or any type of medical staff, and they provide and share their experiences. They also aim to inform the public about specific medical information. And these type of narratives, they are published by medical professionals themselves or by private or government institutions. One example is by the Gen C group in Japan who took the UN COVID-19 guidelines and turned it into a short graphic novel that has been translated into several languages such as English, Spanish, and German. In the second category, graphic orthographies, these are memoirs that are written from the perspective of a patient or a family member, and these are interesting because they are written by non-medical professions, professionals, but they do provide complex medical information in interesting ways. Therefore, the objective of this study is to discover and investigate key visual and verbal resources that aid the comprehension and perception of medical information in a collection of 17 graphic pathographies. The study as a whole has four specific objectives. However, due to however, for this presentation, we decided to only focus on two of them. The first one is to identify specific medical information in the 17 graphic novels and to see what type of visual elements help communicate medical information. This serves as motivation to help improve medical communication. The methodology itself is divided into four categories or four phases. The first phase consisted of collecting, of doing a first round of collection of different types of graphic orthographies in four languages, French, English, Spanish, and Catalan. And we conducted this collection by doing an online word search um, in Google and also by visiting the comic and graphic novel section in different public libraries in Spain, Mexico, and the United States. For phase two, we conducted a second round of word searches on Google to look for more graphic pathographies in French and Catalan. For phase three, we, result, we had a total of 32 graphic pathographies and this list was reduced to 17 graphic pathographies um, and we reduced the, the list according to certain cr criteria. And in total, we ended up with five French, five English, and five graphic um, pathographies and two in Catalan. We only selected two in Catalan because there wasn't a lot to choose from. So the only two ones that we found, um, we selected two graphic novels in Catalan that were relevant to the study. For the final phase, we converted we, we yes, we converted the 17 graphic pathographies into a PDF format and they were imported into MaxQDA, which is a mixed method software. Um, and using this software, we coded all the 17 graphic pathographies um, according to a set of, of codes. Six of them were predetermined and 17 of them emerged during the coding process. In total, we had 23 parent codes and 98 subcodes or secondary codes. For the results 
As you can see, due to our overwhelming number of categories or codes, we decided to only select six for this presentation. For the first objective, we specifically wanted to see what type of medical information is communicated in the graphic novels. The first category, medical procedure, refers to the different types of invasive procedures such as operations and surgeries that are present in the graphic narratives. And this category was present in six graphic pathographies. Each graphic pathography showed the medical procedure in short or small sequences that began with the preparation of the procedure, the procedure itself, post-operation, and the recovery process. As we can see in the example, this is a treatment for uh, a mental disorder where the character is getting um, some nails drilled into her head. For the second category, symptoms, we specifically wanted to label any features that indicated a mental condition, such as mental disorders, cancer, infertility, and genetic disorders. And this category was present in 14 graphic pathographies. Under the medical condition category, we specifically wanted to focus on the patient's routines, support system, side effects, or life changes as a result of the medical condition, and also their opinions on the condition itself. And we found this category in 15 graphic pathographies. In the example, we can see that the main character is suffers from mental disorder and has undergone several um, procedures and as a result she depends on her mother for daily um, tasks such as doing the laundry and this is, falls under the side effect or life change um, sub category of the medical condition code. For the second objective we specifically wanted to look at visual elements that help communicate medical information. The first one is referential metaphor, and this was an emerging category across 14 graphic pathographies. It is specifically focused on using anime, cartoon, and video game characters, as well as animal and superheroes, as reference to help facilitate the reader um, to comprehend the personal, emotional, and medical aspect of a condition. And as we can see, and the example, the father is unable to control his anger or, the, or, his, or his daughter's medical um, condition or his reaction to, to his daughter's medical um, diagnosis that he lashes um, his anger and transforms into the Marvel Hulk superhero. Next, we have color. And color is present in 12 graphic pathographies, and we can see that it's specifically used to accentuate a medical condition, symptoms, medical procedure, or treatments, but it is also used as a transition element between personal and medical experiences. As we can see here, the father is wanting to reset his mindset and see his daughter's Down syndrome diagnosis in a different light. And that, and that transition of resetting his mind is depicted in the change of color. Finally, in style, style is used, or, as we, or we refer to style as a way, uh, is referred to how the panels are organized within the page and also refers to the type of illustration, whether it is, in, in, whether it is presented in a traditional form abstract or combinational form. We refer to traditional form as a typical common um, panel and illustration um, that is present in the traditional form of comics, while abstract it refers to a non-conventional form of illustration and organization of panels, and combinational is a mixture of both the traditional and the abstract form. And specifically in the graphic pathographies we found that the traditional form was used to explain complicated medical information, while the abstract form is specifically presented or help illustrate the symptoms of pain and emotional struggle in reactions to certain medication or to a diagnosis. While combination, the combination of um, style was used for to depict 
or illustrate different types of symptoms and the side effects or life changes caused by the medical condition. One emerging category across all 17 graphic photographies was the emotional category. This emotional aspect was, is present in all the graphic photographies and even though it is not a category that communicates medical information, it is important to take into account when investigating or looking into um, graphic narratives about medicine because they show the other side of an illness and they portray a realistic image of a medical condition. Therefore, they humanize the illness and it's easier or facilitates comprehension about complex medical uh, procedures or any type of complex medical information. As we can see here in this example, this is where the father receives the diagnosis of his daughter that she has Down syndrome. And we can see how he feels that this, that the, this diagnosis is a current that is taking him away from his current reality into an unknown reality. And this causes a sense of overwhelmness, sadness, and confusion. And we can see all of this by him covering his eyes and holding his head and kneeling down and seeing how that future has changed. In the second example, this character suffers from a mental disorder, and this shows her falling down into despair, into darkness, while undergoing different types of medical treatments, which later on we can see that she's walking across different ropes and so we can see that she is that anyone who goes or who might be going through a medical through a mental disorder or a, or a mental condition goes through a lot of different stages or takes a lot of different medical paths to recovery and during this process there is a lot of loss they're in a fragile state but there's also hope for them to reach a stable um, lifestyle to conclude, we can see that the medical content in all the graphic pathographies demonstrate different aspects of living with a medical condition, ranging from the personal, the emotional, and medical perspectives. And even though these the graphic pathographies themselves are just narratives written by a family member or a patient, they do the medical content that they present is important because we're able to see illness in a different way that is traditionally presented by medical institutions or medical professionals. And having this information and looking in to see the different types of visual elements that help communicate medical content can in the future hopefully also improve medical communication between a doctor and their patient or just medical communication in general between hospitals or medical institutions and society with the aim to improve the healthcare system and also to facilitate communication between individuals who come from a different country to receive treatment in a different country and to make that process easy and on scary. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation and if you have any questions or comments or concerns, please feel free to contact me and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you.